This video is the second in a series on the general topic of subtypes and supertypes. Part 1 talked about types of abstractions very broadly interpreted. One type of abstraction is generalization. That is, finding commonalities and defining higher order structures which are more inclusive. We discussed attribute generalization with some examples, pros and cons, and also relationship generalization. This part two will talk about entity generalization, which could be called subtypes and supertypes. The constructs used to represent entity generalization at various diagramming schemes. In part three, we will discuss the constraints on subtype supertype structures along with some notational schemes. We'll get into the interesting stuff now. Let's suppose that we talk to the user and we're finding that they're using all of these kinds of uh, names for things. What might you observe? Or what problems might you find? Well, I guess we've already talked about, say, employee and customer. I'm just extending that, okay? Is an employee a type of person? Could a customer be an organization or a person? Could an employee be a shareholder? Lots of overlap. But if I defined it this way, using those objects, these would all be separate. As soon as you see the commonalities, for example, do shareholders have names and addresses? Do employees? Do customers? Do persons? Yes. You recognize that commonality and you want to handle it. And the way you do that is through generalization. Overlapping populations and commonalities are clues that something else can be done to improve the situation. Fundamental assumption. The main construct is an entity or an object. Each is labeled as an entity type, and each one implies a population of instances. Notice that the, the third bullet here. The grouping of things into types is essentially arbitrary. The world isn't naturally organized that way. We, as designers, impose a particular view for the purpose that we want to make of that data or of those populations. So remember, the designer chooses how they're going to define various object populations. And then probably the most important one is every entity type populations are strictly disjoint. At least that's the system's assumption. Okay? And we know that that's not always true with this example here. Okay, so when do you use subtypes and supertypes? They allow us to formally represent overlapping populations. And the rule here is every member of a subtype must be a member of all of its supertypes. And therefore, we can model two kinds of things this way. One is we can model different roles that are played by members of a supertype population. In this example, I might have person, employee, shareholder, and customer. We notice that there's a commonality across these three different roles, and so we pull that out. And the stuff, the, the information that relates to person independently of what, which role they're playing, we store up there with person. Why would we not do that? Could a shareholder be a, an organization? The answer is yes. But why would we not do this? Can there be multiple supertypes? The answer is yes, notwithstanding that many systems don't allow that. Uh, it's just they didn't want to handle, handle the complexity that stems from that. Uh, but it violates the fundamental rule of subtyping supertyping. It says, Every member of a subtype population must be in all of its supertype populations. 
Well, a person in an organization, that is going, they're going to be exclusive, aren't they? Unless you want to redefine one of them. The other thing that we can model is states of an entity, probably over time, but not necessarily. So here, I might model orders, and the subtypes of an order could be things like the population of orders received, orders validated, and you move into that population once the order is validated, and then you, it could either be filled or go into back order, etc. It's tempting to call this subtype supertype a relationship. Because it's not really a relationship in the sense that we've talked about it before. But I don't know what else to call it when we talk about subtypes and supertypes. A subtype supertype connection or something I suppose we could. So we often just refer to it as a, as a relationship. Okay, population of the, we call it an is a relationship, a subtype uh, is a supertype. So we can write the uh, algebraic notation there. Population of the subtype is always less than or equal to the supertype. And the related members of the two sets are the same instance. And that's what makes it not a relationship. Forming entity types. Again, we indicated it's an arbitrary choice, somewhat arbitrary choice. Sometimes we got some clear boundaries that help us. But sometimes we don't in viewing the world. Um, for example, um, I, I, I might have given you the example before. Uh, we're building this pipeline and we're going to pump oil and stuff through it. What can you pump through a pipeline? Well, it turns out you can pump all kinds of liquids through a pipeline. And in fact, they do. Water and oil and whatever else. And they use what's called a pig to separate them. And it's not perfect because the pig has to slide through the pipeline. Think about a, a, an oil refinery. Okay, you've got stuff moving through it and, and there's no identifiable chunk of the stuff that's moving through the refinery. Just like roads. Okay, when does the road begin and when does the road end? You have to make some choices and that's why I say it's somewhat arbitrary sometimes how you decide what will be the members of a population. Okay. Recognizing when to use subtypes, supertypes, and thinking about generalization or specialization is the way we can do that. Think about entity populations you're modeling, okay? There's two basic situations. Generalization says, I recognize some commonalities, and so I want to put things into a bigger population. In a sense, that's bottom up. You observe commonalities, same type of thing, so you can define a common supertype. Specialization is really kind of looking down. It says, I have a population of things, but there's a subset of that population that I want to handle in a very special way. We use the phrase attributes here, but recognize that when I say attributes in the ORM sense, it's simply other objects that are connected to this object. Okay, anything that's connect, any object that's connected to an object itself can be in, uh, viewed as an attribute. It's a characteristic. It's something that helps to describe that entity. Two conditions must always be true in order for you to use subtypes and supertypes. We've already said that each, well, each subtype must be a subset. It can't be exactly the same as the supertype, otherwise there would be no reason to call out the subtype. Okay? It might be at any point in time they might be the same. But potentially, the, the subtype must be able to be a subset of the supertype. Each instance of the subtype is in every supertype population. We said that before. Each subtype inherits all of the characteristics or attributes of all of its supertypes. Okay? And it has to have additional roles or play additional relationships, or be handled differently in some way. Again, otherwise, you wouldn't call it out as a subtype. So in this example, it has to be a subset and play additional roles. I've got a person, 
and name and birth date would be attributes of a person. An employee is a special role that a person plays. I say an employee is a person. And I could describe an employee, have the attributes of position and salary. And then there might be a subset of employees I'm going to call a boss. Okay? And I say a boss is an employee. And for a boss, I might indicate which organizational unit they're the boss of and what their budget authorization is. You see how we can have attributes at all of those levels. Until a person is an employee, position and salary are, don't make sense for an employee, for a person. This would be considered the subtype supertype hierarchy. And I'll indicate later why we don't want to call it a hierarchy, but I'm going to continue to call it a hierarchy for now. There, as we move up, we have to be able to have more instances. And as we move down, we have to be able to have more roles and or relationships. Okay? That's just a visual way of thinking about these two rules. Okay? If either condition is not true, there is no reason to call it the subtype in a separate definition. So how do we diagram subtypes and supertypes? Well, there's two basic ways. We can either show them, show them nested. Some people call that an Euler diagram. In this example here, I've got a shareholder is a subset of person, and employee is a subset of person, and boss is a subset of employee. It's intuitive, it's clean, it clearly shows that some's in, something's inside of another, or a subset of another. Uh, it's clean and compact, okay? Oftentimes, it's presumed that they're disjoint, the subtypes, okay? If they're not, that can present a problem. Um, this is only a good scheme that's used for simple cases. It's not good for complex cases. It can be difficult to represent both exclusive and overlapping subtypes, as in a Fenn diagram. So if we had this one here, we've got A, B, C, D, and E, and I'm showing you each one of these is a population, and I'm showing you what can overlap and what can't. Okay? The supertype A has some subtypes, and then there's a, a further subtype of E. The other option is what might be called separated. There's not a general agreement as to what to call it, so I'm calling it separated. This is the more common one that's used, and most of the modeling schemes have moved to using this one. It's much easier to show the constraints with this kind of uh, diagrammatic uh, depiction. Um, it's not visually obvious, and there can be confusion with the notion of a relationship. We have arcs between objects in ORM, and we also have these arcs, but in ORM, they're drawn as a heavy, and they're always an arrow, uh, pointing from the subtype to the supertype. I'll just give you two examples of, of what people have done for this in the separated notation. In extended ER from Toby Torrey and company, uh, he uses, puts uh, a circle like here is a connection, and then this means, presumably it means subset or subtype. So this is saying that an employee and a shareholder are subtypes of a person. Uh, another uh, scheme uses a diamond as the connector between the two. In industrial engineering, they use, uh, in IE, they use a notation like this. And they'll have some differences. I talk about this later in this set of slides. But there will be different depictions of that connector in the middle based upon whether or not the subtypes are mutually exclusive or overlapping or whatever. Okay? In IDEF1X, uh, they, uh, they do it like this. And in IDEF1X, you can only define disjoint subtypes. And that's not always the case. Okay? So there are a lot of limitations in some of these notational schemes, and you'll see them when I look at them later. But just understand we have the separated not uh, notation, all right? Now it's time for you to do some work. I want you to convert this diagram. This is the nested view. I want you to convert the nested diagram into a separated sub subtype supertype diagram. Pull out a piece of paper or something, and. Uh, I want you to sketch that out.
Think about how we do modeling in ORM. What's the first thing that we do in modeling in ORM? Nouns, which are going to be the objects. And so we can draw, how many circles are we going to put in our diagram? Right off the bat. You can put those five, right? Then you can worry about how they're related and what the placement might be. But you start out by saying there are five populations here that I'm talking about. So what's going to be at the top? The most general population that includes all of the rest would be A, right? And within A, I would have B, C, and D. Now what about E? It's wholly within C and it's wholly within D. Now, do I have any constraints to put on here? Let me say that when we talk about constraints, we, we make the presumption that the most general case is the default. So that constraints are truly constraints. That's kind of a rule I have in developing any kind of a modeling scheme. It's not the one that's always followed out there. So, uh, the most general case is that things can be incomplete and overlapping. So, do we need to put any constraints on our diagram to properly reflect the set of subtype supertypes? What do you see in that diagram that is going to be violated if I assume that B, C, and D are overlapping? It cannot be B and D. Okay, so, and I haven't talked to you about how you might depict that, but this is how we would do it in ORM. We just, we already know the exclusion constraint. We use that in, this, in the role subset constraint. Okay. So we can just connect those two, uh, those two uh, subtype supertype relationships between A and B and A and D and say you can't be a member of both of those. That's what the exclusion constraint means. Now, Let's suppose that your favorite modeling tool does not allow you to have overlapping subtypes. And that's the norm, by the way. M most of the modeling schemes that are out there say that all the subtypes have to be exclusive. So what are you going to do here? Right now, we've got you can be in B and C together, you can be in C and D together. So what do you think you have to do? Well, you can look at your diagram and you can see where do we have some areas. You could be in B only. Or you could be in C only. But you could also be in the BC combination, right? And if we draw, have those three uh, as subtypes, B, B, C, and C, then those would be mutually exclusive subtypes, right? So that's how we would do it. And how would you model E? Yeah, it would be under the CD population because it's wholly within that one. Okay, you have to be a member of both of them. So you see how you can go between these two uh, diagramming schemes. Now that you've learned about subtype supertype structures, how they can be represented graphically, and how they are used, the next part in this series will be constraints on subtype supertype relationships. In fact, you've already seen expressions of constraints in some of the examples we've seen presented.